Mr. Brandon Munro, how are we, sir? I'm well, Matt. It's been a big week. It has been a big week. Lots going on. What stood out for you? Well, there's been something for everyone this week in the land of energy and nuclear power. Uh, we've had a whole host of SMR news. We've had the IEA re uh, release their World Energy uh, Electricity Market Report. We've had intrigue amongst the juniors. Uh, where would you like me to start? Well, I, well, I saw. I, well, why don't we start with some on, on SMRs first? Because I want to talk about the IEA in a second. Well, the, the whole show could be about SMR news, but I'll I'll draw your attention to what I think is the highlight. So X Energy, which is an SMR developer, um, towards the smaller end of modular reactors, uh, about eighty megawatts per module that can be stacked. Uh, they've uh, signed an agreement with Washington State-based US utility, Northwest Energy, to deploy 12 of these X energy units um, at an existing nuclear power station um, that Northwest Energy has. Now, they're already cooperating with them, and they said in, I think it was April 2021, that they would be deploying four at that Columbus nuclear power station. Now they've upgraded to 12. Now that's great news for them and it's good timing for X Energy as well because they're in the midst of uh, listing onto the New York Stock Exchange via a SPAC. They've had to reprice it. To, you know, it's been in a little bit of a flux, but it adds to some really significant other agreements that they've signed recently as well. I think the most notable of which is an agreement with Dow to deploy their reactors into the future in some of its Gulf state uh, refining and chemical operations. Now that was somewhat breaking news when it happened last year because it's the first example of a industrial company partnering with an SMR company and illustrating one of the many, many industrial applications for carbon abatement that we're going to see come out of the small module uh, reactor uh, universe. Now, it's particularly interesting here because we've been talking about the fact that the SMRs, they're not going to want to get moving on orders for one or two here or there. They're going to need relatively bulk orders because the whole idea of an SMR is to build a factory that can produce many in factory conditions. And this is now clearly designed to give them that start. We're not gonna give you a first of the kind. We're not gonna just give you a proof of concept. We're gonna give you an order book for 12, which uh, probably is enough to keep their factory busy for the first couple of years and on which they can then build the basis for other orders. The way that I see small modular reactor market developing is the front runners, because there are about 80 different designs in the world at the moment that we know about, the front runners will find themselves in the fortunate position of being run over in the rush once different applications or the, need, the users of different applications can be assured that they're actually going forward and they're actually building their factory and they're creating the prototypes and then putting them into development. And so somewhere towards the end of this decade, somewhere around 2028, 29, 2030, there'll be a jostling to make sure that various producers, industrial companies who really need the carbon abatement that SMRs can deliver, they'll be scrambling to try and get their place in the queue for these order books for the front running SMRs. And so, Northwest Energy have been very clever with this because uh, they've got their, got their order in place. Dow are being very clever with it because by cooperating early with X Energy, you'd assume that if they want to expand their order to 100 reactors, which is what they would need, um, they'll be treated very well in terms of the order book. So very interesting, very illustrative, I believe, of how I see the SMR market playing out. And they're also targeting the first of these reactors to be uh, online by 2030. So for many people, both inside and outside the industry, that seems early. But for me, that's entirely consistent with what the uh, economic, political and uh, carbon accounting forces are gonna have to do 
for SMRs to play the role they need to do. Absolutely. I mean, that kind of deals with the kind of um, the kind of the scaling and, quite frankly, the kind of project delivery model side of things. But it also suggests that in in terms of the what's the the quiet admin that goes on in the background that there's that they're confident around those of licensing and regulatory. Uh, matters as well, which is not, nothing short of good news um, for um, SMRs and ho- hopefully cheaper uh, electricity and energy for um, users. Um, let's talk about the uh, IEAs. I guess there's a couple of things that they put out the electricity market report recently. I mean, what, are, what are the highlights for you? Oh, I don't know if you'd call it a highlight, but one of the most interesting aspects is the way that the data supports what we've been reading about and what we've anticipated, which is the sheer destruction of European industry that rely that are high energy users. So the data tracks that IEA doesn't try particularly hard to sugarcoat it. And it's very obvious that a large number of uh, energy intensive industries have either closed down or relocated out of Europe. And uh, so that comes in pretty uh, plain and simple. A um, couple of other interesting aspects. The, there is a bit of gloss here and there. Uh, it couldn't be resisted. So uh, the, the the whole thing that we learnt back in university about how much statistics can be manipulated to tell any story you want, it's worth having a look through that and keeping that in mind. There's one chart that uh, Feti Birol actually put on his Twitter page as the headline chart, which on the face of it demonstrates, you know, that coal's gone down and renewable energy is growing at such a rate that it can meet all of our global energy demand increases over the next two years. Now, the scale on that is about a 1,000 terawatt hours. Now, bear in mind that coal-fired power around the world is more than 10,000 terawatt hours. So if you were to give that the full scale, you'd see those decreases in coal are absolutely minuscule. And in fact, the data doesn't lie. There was a big increase in coal in 2020. 2022 and a lot of that of course was to do with what's been going on in Germany and Europe. So interesting read, well worth having a look but uh, you do need to keep a, a reasonable dose of scepticism as you read it. Right and which kind of <laughs> brings me neatly on to a tweet which I think you you, you put out. Um, it, it seems that businesses now need to not only run their own businesses but perhaps learn how to trade energy uh, it seems. Yeah so I, I couldn't resist tweeting about this, there was right at the end of the report, and and I should explain to the audience that we've talked on several occasions on this energy show about anticipating that in the near future, there will be so much electricity volatility because of over-penetration of renewable energy and over-reliance on batteries that ultimately won't deliver that uh, normal businesses that are energy users, factories, you know, manufacturers, let alone large scale smelters and other serious energy users, they're going to have to become energy traders to manage the cost risk associated with electricity volatility. We've already seen it in South Australia and they were the prominent example on the last chart in the report that IEA put out. Now, the, the bit that got me going, I suppose, and uh, the reason why I couldn't resist tweeting was the spin that was put on it. And instead of saying, oh, things are going to get super volatile and let's just show you a chart that shows how much volatility in electricity prices are linked to increasing penetration of renewable energy into a grid, uh, the spin that was put on it instead was, hey, th- we've got some great news the uh, arbitrage business opportunities are becoming even more attractive. So, of course, a more attractive arbitrage is another way of saying the system is broken. And that spin uh, is more spin than a wind turbine in ideal wind conditions, I'd say. But uh, as I said, there's still good data in the report, so it's well worth a look. Okay, we'll put put a link to the report because there's a lot going on there and it does cover a lot of countries. and, and, and their plans, but yeah, I, I think. Well, this this is this is like reporting one hundred and one, isn't it? It's, it's kind of like, do I want to be positive or do you want to be negative? What's what's going to sell more? Um, and and saying to a business owner who's got enough problems, oh, would you mind either employing someone or you know spending a, a, a lot of your time trying to work out how you manage your uh, energy costs? Um, probably won't go down too well. So. Uh, 
arbitrage opportunities indeed my goodness and, and part um, of part of the reason sorry matt part of the reason why i believe it's been positioned that way is the energy arbitrage is the unspoken justification for a very large percentage of battery deployments grid scale battery deployments around the world you know and the governments will stand up south australia is a perfect example the government will stand up and say we've got this fantastic battery and to demonstrate what a good idea batteries are, the, uh, the sponsor of this battery, they've done their economics and it's going to have a two-year payback. What they don't explain is that the reason it's got a two-year payback is because there's so much arbitrage opportunities that are ultimately a cost to the consumer that this battery, this small little battery that doesn't actually do anything except smooth the consistency disaster that the government's created in the first place they make so much money and that's what the payback is it's not the same as saying a battery that isn't designed as an arbitrage trading artifice it's not the same as saying a battery that provides broad scale multi-hour multi-seasonal stability is going to make anything like that sort of money so it's a key driver for battery deployment amongst, uh, you know, this big industry that we call renewables. Right, uh, right, exactly the point. Like we we, we talk about base load energy for a reason, um, introducing an, another additional component to the infrastructure required to deliver that energy. Um, I don't know, some politicians, especially some of your Australian ones, uh, we, we've been here. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. Um, perhaps haven't quite got the numbers quite right. But look, we need to move on. So there's a, there's a big, big, big packed show this week uh, before we kind of get into winners, losers, um, et cetera. Uh, UBC uh, made an announcement recently, which I think obviously good for them, but it's sort of had some knock-on effects. Perhaps, should we just talk around that for a sec? So what's, what's their news? Uh, so UEC's uh, announced that they're, they've had some good success at their Christensen Ranch. That's an in-situ recovery project in Wyoming. And uh, because of that, they're looking to accelerate the restart of that ISR uranium mine. So good for them. This is now part of the package that they bought from Uranium One for about $200 million not that long ago, 2021. And uh, as part of that, the uh, Irigaray processing plant is the hub for their Wyoming hub and spoke uh, approach to ISR production. Now, unfortunately, one of the spokes was supposed to be Peninsula Energy with their Lance project. And uh, as everyone who follows this sector would know, Peninsula have been getting very close to starting production or restarting production at Lance. And in fact, even in May, they put out an announcement saying that we're on track for mid-year production, everything's great. It would seem that because of these advanced plans that UEC have, that they've had to say to uh, Peninsula, sorry, we no longer have space in our own processing facility to let you in. And Peninsula announced that they've now got to delay the restart because uh, of the contractual right that UEC had to give 270 days notice uh, saying that we'll terminate. And Peninsula decided that they wouldn't try and produce for some or all of those 270 days. They would instead uh, pull on the reins while they still could before they'd started uh, producing and potentially, um, you know, with these ISR fields, as Wayne Haley explained, uh, you can have a problem where if you stop, start, stop, start, you can um, significantly erode the future potential of these ISR deposits. So he didn't want to do that. So they've yanked on the reins, they've paused the restart program, and they're instead going directly to their phase two approach, which is higher production and uh, entirely utilising their own processing facilities so that they don't need to toll treat through their neighbour. So tough for Peninsula. You know, Wayne's a fantastic guy. It's, it's hard to see. Uh, but then again, you know, from UEC's perspective, it looks like it's a success-driven outcome for them. And they paid proper money for these assets from uh, Uranium One. So, of course, their shareholders would be expecting them to maximise the value and contractual terms are contractual terms. Yeah, you, you, you look after number one every single time, right? So UEC's made the right call for them. 
Um, I think for obviously Peninsula, perhaps wasn't what they wanted to hear. Um, and they're no doubt will have contingency plans in place. And they're, if they're going straight to stage two and d delaying things in terms of production, um, I guess short term, that's not going to make the market too excited or the shareholders too pleased. But, you know, th th there you go. They, that, that's down to Wayne and, and, and the board to kind of uh, re resolve. Um, I don't want to kind of focus on that. I, I know there was a call yesterday where some of that was explained and, you know, to varying degrees of success, it, it would seem. Um, but it, do, it brings on us a much bigger question um, that investors should ask of their own investments, of the companies that they're in, of the CEOs that they're backing, which, which is around risk mitigation. Because it's all, you know, it's always exciting to talk about blue sky and upside and, you know, we're going to grow and the market's always going to be great and there's unicorns and butterflies everywhere at all times. But the market's not like that. You need to put plans in place for the, the what if scenario. And usually if the what if things are a little bit disappointing, what if things don't quite go according to plan? What if the market is you know squeezing us like we're in now? So in terms of that risk mitigation for, you know, you run a company, you're a public market CEO. How, how does one go about identifying the things that you should look at in terms of that risk mitigation and how, how you can minimize the effect on the, on the company, on the share price, on your ability to do business? Because in some cases, if you don't, we've seen it's, it's terminal, right? Or, you know, delays things by a couple of years. It, it, it's, it's big. So what, what's your process? Well, I'm happy to talk about ours because we publish our risk policy on our website that people can go to. So Bannerman Energy dot com so the way the approach that we take which is generally regarded as best practice governance is we have a risk register the risk register is broken up into the various aspects of what we do as a business you know there's technical there's health and safety there's capital markets and so on and uh, regularly management reviews the risk register which is now more than 10 years old in our case uh, checks that things are up to date, changes things, and every risk is identified. It's given a heat map type coding according to, first of all, what are the uh, probability or the likelihood? Secondly, what are the consequences? And that gives a combined score, unmitigated. Then we identify what the different mitigation steps that are either taken now or could be taken reactively in the future. How would those mitigation steps affect either the probability score or the consequence score? And then you get a, unmitiga a mitigated blended score. And then according to the process, there's a summary where any score that um, is of a certain uh, score or higher gets elevated to the front, which uh, sits in front of the board. So we review that regularly as a management team. It goes in front of our audit and risk committee uh, once a year at least, we elevate uh, any new critical risks to them. And it's a very useful process, apart from just the discipline of reminding an ex-co to be always focused on the risks. Quite often you'll find that there are some mitigation steps that effectively have no cost except for planning. So the cost of an ex-co getting together, identifying a risk, thinking what they can do, and in many cases, implementing some of the first steps along that path is just time. That sometimes it costs money, of course, and then you've got to weigh it up. Now, that's what we do at a corporate level. What we also do as part of the uh, feasibility process and now into front-end engineering and design is we have what are called HAZOP workshops, which take in financial risks to the project, which obviously is largely focused on the risks of some of our costing, capital and operating costing, um, both upside and downside risk to what we've assumed in our feasibility study. Uh, also health and safety risks, of course, being uranium, we need to deal with radiological risks, um, other operating risks like attractive and attracting and retaining people and all that sort of stuff. Um, so they're very intense because they're done at a project level. And we had one last month where we I had a bunch of people fly into Johannesburg to sit for a, a day and a half with our team at Wood, Wood being the lead consulting engineers on the definitive feasibility study that we published in December and who are leading the front end engineering and design that we're continuing. So they're the two aspects of what we do. I think most people would say that that's 
best practice governance. Um, and, you know, I, I can't talk specifically about examples because they're all confidential, but I can say that I could easily come up with half a dozen risks since I've been CEO for the last seven and a half years, where through having that system, we were able to substantially and large, and in many cases, entirely mitigate those risks just through that discipline and planning process. Right. Well, look, and we'll put a link to um, the the page on your website where people can look look at that because I think that's really fascinating. Because, like I say, for, for me, it's all well and good, you know, looking to the future and you know when when everything goes according to plan, but very rarely in mining do things go according to plan. So investing in companies who actually thought about it, have got an idea of what they need to do in certain circumstances is all part of our investing um, policy uh, and um, it served us well. Right, we better, we'd better move on because I said there's a lot to talk about. We've got to, we kind of, we, we've got to go back to our normal format uh, where we'll usually start is with, let's talk about uh, the winner of the week. Who have you allocated that to this week? So the winner of the week is Poland because they're getting on with wow. things. Uh, lots of announcements this week, although Poland have been hard at it uh, growing their new nuclear power business over a long period of time now, over the last few years. Uh, for the uninitiated, Poland is the heaviest polluter in Europe. Their grid is still dominated by coal. And for, for various reasons, they're able to implement what's sometimes known as the leapfrog phenomenon. In other words, they have decided that they're going to go from what was a very effective 20th century form of baseload power, coal, it was plentiful, it was cheap, it was baseload, they were able to build heavy industry on it. They've leapfrogged over the renewable energy experiment that a lot of Europe has gone through, and they're going straight to nuclear. And there's been many announcements, but just some of them that caught my eye in the last week is that they've now signed deals with South Korea um, relating to uh, SMRs and potentially large-scale deployment. Uh, South Korea, as many people would know, is a top five uh, con uh, producer of nuclear energy. They're also what would be described today as the most successful Western developer or, of nuclear power plants after their success in the UAE with the BRCA nuclear power plant. And because of their heavy shipping industry, they've got, you know, Doosan Heavy Industries and others who are real forerunners in the small modular reactor market. Um, another th uh, news item, so the Ministry of Climate and Environment has approved a copper producer deploying an SMR plant. Um, they're looking to deploy a new scale power plant to support their industrial activities. You know, the world will see a lot more of that. So I'm very pleased to see Poland taking concrete steps forward on that. And the Polish state-owned development bank, BGK, I won't even attempt to pronounce what that stands for, uh, they have announced that they'll lend 500 million euros uh, as an initial facility to help finance the building of small modular reactors in Poland. So if you're interested, go and have a look at what Poland's doing. There is a long list of achievements over the last couple of years where they really are making progress. Uh, but that's the three things that caught my eye this week. And I thought that was good enough to give them the gong for being winner of the week. Well done, Poland. Well done, Poland, knocking it out of the park. Lots of um, links below um, in, in the commentary, so do go and check that out. Um, and again, my favorite of the week, bungle of the week. <laughs> who, who, who's getting it this week? Uh, this is an unfortunate bungle. I, I feel like we need kind of the violin here playing in the background, but the poor people of New York, the grid operator there has announced that in 2025, oopsie, they're going to have an electricity shortfall during certain periods, um, particularly in summer. So it's, it's about half a gigawatt, 446 megawatts of capacity. Uh, it's still quite a sizable amount. Now it could get a lot worse than that. That's assuming they're not gonna go through a significant heat wave. But if we just work on that, the reason it's a bungle is, uh, through a lot of activist intervention, they decided to close down units three, uh, two and three of the Indian Point nuclear power plant. 
So they closed down two gigawatts of perfectly safe emissions-free power in 2020 and 2021. Now, black mark number one is they entirely replaced that with gas. Uh, they opened three new gas-fired power stations for 1.8 gigawatts of capacity. So this whole myth about we're going to close nuclear power plants and build renewables in their place, this is the perfect go-to example that it does not work that way. And now on top of that, they've realised that, oops, we're going to be short by you know half a gigawatt, which is a substantial amount of renewable energy. Uh, well, substantial amount of energy that renewables won't really be able to plug on any sort of consistent basis. So uh, it's the bungle of the week because mainly because of how much political and NGO interference went into that decision-making process at Indian Point. And now, you know, to an extent, they're getting their just desserts with that in terms of the problems that were entirely predicted at the time, um, that were canvassed at the time. Not only was it identified that they would need to replace that nuclear power with emissions generating fossil fuel power, but also that the resultant uh, volatility in the system would lead to power shortages. So they were warned and this is the end result. You kind of think, given the history of Indian Point, um, <laughs> they'd, be, they'd be honest. In fact, we, I guess we have uh, a lot to thank Indian Point uh, for in terms of regulations, uh, e e et cetera. So, uh, Worth worth looking at the history there, um, but okay, bungle of the week. Well, well done, New York State. Um, question for you though: always like to ask a question, which is uh, this week around Paladin Energy. Now they obviously the the, the poster child um, of of the last cycle. Um, they have decided to, or they have retained a seventy five percent interest in their um, Michelin um, JV in Labrador. What can you tell us? Uh, so I'm not surprised this is question of the week because it's been, the reporting on it's been a little bit scatter gun and maybe we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, so there's a lot of history with the Michelin Uranium Project in Labrador. So Paladin bought it back in 2011. Um, there was a moratorium in place in that part of Canada on uranium mining, but Paladin obviously saw something in that because they bought it anyway. Uh, they paid $1.90 a pound US for the project. So they paid, paid proper money for a development project, but they were awarded because in 2012, the moratorium was lifted and they were able to recommence exploration there. So that kept kicking along. Uh, it also became famous because in 2015, to my knowledge, it's the only example of a waiver for a a uranium project in Canada, they've got their non-resident ownership policy, which basically means that a foreign company is perfectly entitled to own 100% of an exploration project in uranium. But if you want to bring that into production, you've got to make sure that Canadian companies have 51% of that. So Paladin was able to achieve a waiver back in 2015 because it said that that will enable us to develop it and they were expecting to have it in production by I think 2019, which obviously for market related reasons didn't happen. So it's, it's an example of where, the only example that I'm aware of where the geopolitical ring fence around Canadian uranium was pierced. Then we fast forward to 2017 when Paladin sadly went into administration and the Michelin project was offered a security for a, a, a prepayment that EDF, the French nuclear giant, made to Paladin to enable it to finance its expansion, either at Langer Heinrich or at Kyla Kera back then. It was about $200 million and it was to be repaid in uranium. So, of course, when Paladin went into administration, uh, the administrators were able to exercise their rights with that repayment. But the EDF was able to assert its rights over the Michelin project. And in the overall wash up, the, those parties, those right holders, got a 50% contributing interest 
into the Michelin project. So Paladin went from 100 down to 50, and they were able to re-earn their way back into it at 5% per year for doing X, Y, and Z over five years. We're getting to the story, Matt. We're, we're getting to the point here. Just hang in there. No, five no, years it's, later, it's Paladin's, hilarious. Gone, <laughs> Paladin's gone 50, 55, and so on, up to 75%, which is where it finds itself now. Now, under the contractual terms of the joint venture, uh, once they got to 75%, they would need to make a best efforts attempt to sell the whole thing, which was the way of buying out the joint venture parties so that they would ultimately get some cash out from their previous security that they'd held. So the headline and what Paladin's just announced to answer the question that um, one of the uh, Crux members has asked here, is Paladin has just announced that they've been through this process, they've done their best to sell it, but they couldn't find any other buyers on acceptable commercial terms. So the good news for Paladin is they get to keep their 75% interest in this project. Uh, they don't have to sell it off um, to somebody else. So good news for Paladin, positively, but uh, as is often the case in today's media cycle, uh, it was quite confusingly reported. And the best example that I saw was um, a Reuters headline. Uh, so remember, this is good news for Paladin. They were very happy with this result. Uh, they would have been worried that someone would have pitched to buy this asset out of them at um, commercial terms. So Reuters reported that Australian uranium miner Paladin slips on failure to sell Michelin joint venture. So, uh, you know, maybe there was a coincidental drop in Paladin share price, but it certainly had nothing to do with the great triumph of failing to sell their project despite exercising their best efforts to do so. Sometimes when the phrase best efforts is used, you need to ask best efforts to do what precisely? So uh, it, I love that story. It, it's good. It's good. Right. Conscious time. You've got places to be. Um, tweet of the week. You're allocating that to who? So it's a it's a uh, Twitter handle that I don't know particularly well, but I saw this and I decided I'd have a closer look. John Lee Pettimore. So we'll have this up on the screen. There we go. Now, it's a tweet that just illustrates one of the fundamental flaws in so many com uh, countries' energy policy. This ridiculous assumption that storage will get cheaper because it's got something to do with technology and everything that we know about technology follows Moore's law, gets half the price for twice the strength and so forth. Um, so what John Lee Pettimore has done here is illustrated that uh, by 2050, if the fossil fuel output was to be replaced entirely by renewables, and we haven't checked the numbers, but it sort of rings true for me, that would require today's rate of production for lithium to go for 9,921 years, 7,101 years for vanadium, 1733 years for cobalt, and so on. The point is, something that we've said many times in this show, that so many of these assumptions about renewable energy penetration, storage and firming capacity is based on an assumption that us in the minerals energy fundamentally disagree with, which is that there is a never ending supply of increasingly cheaper raw materials that can come out of the earth. We know as miners that that just isn't the case. And so John Lee Pettimore has put that up in lights. We could probably argue about his assumptions in his modeling and all of that. And as I say, I haven't checked it, but it rings true and it certainly illustrates why we're heading off a cliff with current energy policy in so many different countries. And ultimately it's the consumers and the society and the people who are relying on jobs from energy consumptive industries that are gonna pay for that. So hopefully the penny starts to drop and we start to have more honest conversations about energy policy around the world. Never a truer word. Okay, we'd like to say whether, whether you buy his assumptions or not, um, the, the point is we just haven't got enough of this stuff and to go 100% renewable is, it's going to be nigh on impossible and I think a ludicrous uh, goal. To that end, I'm actually going to chuck in a, a, a tweet of the week 
uh, myself. So, you know, we saw, and this is a, se a very long segue I'm about to do. So you, you saw um, the, in the US, um, the, um, the House Foreign Affairs Committee hearing with uh, John Kerry, he was being, because he is the climate czar right for for the US and um you know he's you know he's been pulled up about you know flying around the world to these various conferences etc uh using private jets now he he has vehemently de denied that he owns a private jet and um i think he was caught out last week um with with this because what he, what he meant by i don't have a private jet was it's not mine it's my wife's <laughs> so <laughs> Which I, which I just love this semantic. He will sit there, stone, stone, cold stone face, and 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 basically lie about it, you know. And a public figure like that is always going to get caught out with with the, with those sorts of semantics. So I, I just kind of liked that sort of dumb naivety or that dumb arrogance, I, I suspect, um, in terms of how you how, how you defend your position as the. Uh, energy czar flying around in private jets round 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 the world when you're talking about trying to build out a renewable infrastructure. But that's well, my suppose, long segue into. Well, I, I suppose he can make the point that he's never had jet propulsional relations with that woman, his wife. <laughs> Very good. It was worth it. It was worth it. Um, but that was my segue into my. Uh, tweet of the week, which is um, to do with the Scottish National Party have been under a lot of pressure because um, they've been accused of felling, cutting down 14 million trees to build wind farms. And they vehemently denied it, vehemently denied it. And um, in some ways they were right. Some ways they were right. It wasn't 14 million, it was 16 million. So <laughs> the John Kerry tweet of the week, I'm going to allocate to the Scottish National uh, Party. Um, so there we go. We got there in the end. We got there. It's a bit of a long one, but we got there. Um, let's finish with it on, on a high. Moonshots and fizzers, you're going to give that? Um, or we're going to talk about who this week? Great British nuclear. So this is a country where you are, of course, and uh, where most of our convict settlers came from in Australia. Uh, it's just Britain, called British, British. No, not, there's nothing great about it. Well, it is when you put it with the word nuclear. So the great British nuclear um, movement is now kicking off. And um, it does significantly recognise the shortfalls that we've been talking about on this show today. What they've done is they've launched this, this, uh, this movement, great British nuclear. They're kicking it off with a good old fashioned competition. So the competition is uh, putting some serious money on the line to design more innovative and radical forms of small modular reactors. They want to have the first of those in the grid by the beginning of next decade. Uh, but it's also the ambition to achieve 25% uh, of the grid from nuclear power by 2050. And remember, this is a growing grid because electricity growth is increasing everywhere around the world as uh, carbon abatement pushes more and more applications onto the electricity grid instead of burning fossil fuels. So it's a really good step in the right direction. Interesting how much of the emphasis is on national security and energy security. So what they want to do is they want to make nuclear in Britain from Britain. They want the power to be delivered to their country where they can control all of that power production. And as we've talked about many times, nuclear power enables that, particularly given how many years forward of uranium you can store in your own secured warehouse in a country. So well done, Britain. It's a good move. Um, it's yet another step in this uh, progression that they've made that's got cross-floor support or bipartisan support towards redefining their their economy really with the backbone of nuclear power. Well, okay, let, let's, uh, great initiative, hope that goes well. Currently we have a lot of our nuclear reactors owned by Chinese companies, new technologies owned by Japanese companies. Um, may, maybe this is the beginning of something where they've suddenly realized perhaps we need to stand control of some of this stuff. Let's see how they go. Well done GBN, great, great British nuclear. Uh, link below if you want to read more. Um, 
Brandon, we better let you go. You've got important things to do. Um, appreciate this week. Good chats. I say lots going on. I'm, I'm sure we can spend hours talking about any one of those topics. Um, perhaps we'll, we'll come back to them at a later date. We sure could. Thanks, Matt.